Amen. I want to remind you of our regular services every Sunday morning, 10 a.m., every Sunday evening at 6. Amen. Uh, of course, we have our midweek service at 7 tonight. Amen. Uh, Sunday morning, we have our regular sermon service. Amen. And Sunday evening, it's our we do a Bible study, kind of like what we're doing tonight. And uh, it's a good time. Amen. If you've missed anything, Amen. Whether you're watching from home or you're in the building, amen, uh, you can uh, look us uh, at New Destiny Drupal Valley, amen, on Facebook and, and uh, YouTube, amen. And if you go to YouTube, you'll see all of our past services for the past, uh, it's probably close to a year and a half now, amen. And I uh, want to remind you, this Saturday, amen, all you women, this Saturday, it is showtime for you, amen. You, it, is, it is a show time, amen. We're going to have the women's class this Saturday, amen. We got people from all over Southern California and Arizona coming in, amen, for this thing, amen. So uh, I don't know what we're going to do, amen, but we're going to worship God, amen, amen. Uh, we'll be, uh, just so you guys know, what we're going to do is uh, the, the women, I, I want you guys to, to take control of it because I want to make sure that you guys, as people are coming in, you offer masks and that kind of stuff for them. Make sure they know where the sanitizers and all that. We're going to make sure everything's sanitized and clean uh, before they come. We want to make sure everybody feels comfortable and safe. Mm -hmm. Amen. Um, so that'll be this Saturday. Get here early. Uh, it starts at 11. you got to be here early. This is Mark to let you guys know what time. Amen. Hold her to it because she'll be late. Amen. So uh, but it starts at 11. Uh, there, all the women in the area churches are excited. Amen. So, uh, Sister Debbie, she's excited. Amen. It's going to be a good time. Sunday morning, we're going to have uh, Sister Debbie's husband, Pastor Andy yeah. Fernandez. Amen. He'll be here Sunday morning. Amen. It's going to be a good time in the house of God. Amen. amen. Yes, amen. Uh, next weekend, a uh, week from Saturday, we're going to have, we're going to start our two, a two-day uh, revival, amen, with pa uh, Pastor Evangelist uh, Patrick Gonzalez. Amen. So that's Saturday the 21st. We are going to have a citywide outreach. We're going to have probably about 100, 150 people come from area churches, uh, including from El Central California, the all through LA, the deserts. All the deserts are all coming. They're going to come out here, and, uh, and we're just going to go out, and we're going to pass out flyers. I bought a bullhorn, and we're going to go knock out. We're going to hit a corner. There are people yeah. holding signs. We're going to go yes. knock out apartments yes. and houses and everything else. And just bring the gospel to the city, amen. amen. So that's going to be uh, the following weekend, the 21st and the 22nd, amen. Pastor Patrick will be here for that Saturday night at 6, and also that Sunday morning at 10. And don't forget that outreach will start at 11 o'clock on that Saturday, amen. amen. Um, the Looking forward, amen, September the 10th and 11th, we'll be in Ensenada for a two-day revival, amen, with Pastor Gustavo, amen. It's going to be a good time down there. Amen. Anybody interested, let me know. Um, I can give you information on, on where to stay. Um, but it's going to be a good time. We will have a regular service here on that 12th, that Sunday here. So church isn't canceled. Church is not canceled. We will be here. Amen. Amen. So that's what we're doing up for the revival. And uh, don't forget, Mariah and Jerry, they don't take games when it comes to recycling. Uh, they will sit there. They will get you. And they'll make sure you put it in the right way. Amen. Hallelujah. These are all the announcements. Amen. Uh, we're going to lift up an offering. Amen. Let's worship God. Amen. Hallelujah, amen. Do you know what this uh, this evening, amen, you give with an open heart, amen. You allow God, amen, to bless you, amen. Uh, you know what? Uh, we're, we're in modern times, modern days, amen. We, uh, we uh, you know, old times, it's just you. You, got to, you can only give in the basket, amen. But you know, we got people watching all around, literally around the world. Amen. Watch our sermons. Amen. So we want to make sure everybody feels like they're uh, they're a part of it. So we do we do give online through Zelle. Amen. So if you uh, if you don't bring money or checkbook or something, you can give on Zelle. Amen. It would be good to do that. Amen. Um, so you know what? Uh, you allow God to bless your life. Amen. And you allow God. Amen. To just be the Lord of everything you have. Amen. You know, a lot of times we give God everything, amen, except our finances, amen. Let's just surrender it all to God tonight, amen. And just say, God, you know what? Here I am to serve you, amen. So let's bow our hearts, amen, and Brother Jesse, we can bless the different giver. Heavenly Father, Lord, we give you thanks, Lord, for the opportunity to give back to you what righteously belongs to you, Father God. Lord. Father God, Lord, we ask you that you bless the gift and the giver, Father God. Lord. Father God, Lord, that you bless the finances of the people that are giving, Father God, Lord, that your hands are upon them, Father God, Lord upon the church, Father God, Lord. Father God, Lord, that you continue to move forward, Father God, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. And what a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. The angels are before him.
Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So if you got your Bibles tonight, uh, we'll be in the book of Acts. The book of Acts. Give me a second here. Chapter 26. Amen. Uh, let me get my, my mic. So this is your first time here. We welcome you. Uh, what we do on these evening services right now is we do a, a Bible study. And what I'm doing is we're going through the Bible. You know, we're going through like the entire book of Acts is what we did. Uh, right now we're in chapter 26. And we've gone all the way through from 1 all the way to 26. And we'll continue every Wednesday until we complete the book. We've done that with several of the books in the Bible. And uh, it's pretty good because we get into like this. We, get, we, we keep it to the simplicity of what the Word of God is. Uh, for a living, my job, I have to be very uh, articulate in my, re my reading. So i got to really pay attention to certain things. And uh, so when I'm reading the Bible, I really pay attention to like little details that, that sometimes we read right over. So that's what we're going to do. And as I read it, um, I'll give explanation and, and, and let you know what you know what this is and why. Uh, kind of give you backstory, amen, to let you know what's happening with what happened that God is there, plus what's going on at what we're going to. At any time, if you have questions, you have any input, anything that 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 God spoke to you about, amen, feel free to lift up your hand and say, hey, I didn't understand that, or, or you know what, this is what I think, and, and, and we'll go ahead and, and move forward. That's why it's a Bible study, so we can all participate, amen, so we do it like this every uh, Wednesday evening, and right now for every Sunday evening, amen. Sunday morning we do our regular service. Yes. But we're going to have a good time in the house of God. Amen. 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 So we've been reading about Paul. Okay, so I'll give you a little backstory. So Paul, the Apostle Paul, amen, is, the, the name is, is really popular when you when you're get into Christianity and you understand, you know, about what goes on in the Bible. And the reason why it's a popular name is because the Apostle Paul, when he got saved and he gave his life to Jesus, there was a big transformation into who he was. And most of the most of the writings in the New Testament were written by Paul, um, and most of the most of those writings he did while he was in jail, while he was while he was locked up and being persecuted, falsely accused of many things. Right now we're reading about Paul, and he's going to go speak with King Agrippa, and and what's happened to this point is the 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 Jews, the the religious people, the the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they've been. They've been following him around, trying to persecute him, trying to kill him. They, uh, they've been trying to ambush him. They're, they're trying to get him to go somewhere, the, 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 the commander to send him somewhere, and they wait, and they want to ambush him. I, uh, last week I spoke about, about how, how uh, I went to the, the, the National uh, uh, Human Rights Museum in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, it's where, those of you who don't know, that's where Martin Luther King was killed. It, it, it's, the, it's the hotel. In the back of it, they, they gutted it all out, made a museum out of it. But the room where Martin Luther King stayed is still there and intact. His, his, his uh, suitcase is there. His car is still parked up front. And and what I talked about is because what they've been doing is they've been laying in wait. So they want Paul to go from one place and try to get the commander to send him somewhere else. And and the reason why the, 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 the Jews and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, what they're doing that for is they want him to go somewhere because they're laying in wait trying to attack him. They're just waiting. They want to sneak up on him. They want to ambush him. The reason why I brought up that, that, that bring up the, the National Rights Museum, because over there, I, I mentioned this last week, you, uh, you go to the museum, you see all that, you can see the room, you can see everything that they did, and then you can go across the street to the hotel room, to the bathroom area where the guy who shot Martin Luther King, where he stood with the gun and shot him. And I remember, and what I said was, I remember when I went over there and I'm looking across the street where, where, where Martin Luther King would have been standing, uh, the first thought in my mind was, what a coward. You know, this guy was so, was so adamant about killing Martin Luther King and, and, and stopping the movement that uh, uh, you would have thought he wouldn't have been some cowardice and he wouldn't have hid in the restroom across the street where, he, where nobody could see him, but he was like really close to him. So it was a cowardice move. But that's what these guys are doing. There's cowardice moves, they're waiting. Uh, They've been putting up uh, uh, Paul up at the trial, trying to get him uh, convicted. Uh, Paul's already done over two years in prison uh, because one guy who should have been giving judgment didn't want to do it, didn't want to deal with it, left it for the next guy. 
So that's what Paul's at now. He's still trying to get, he's still trying to get sentence, he's still trying to get judgment because he's done nothing wrong. Everything that they're saying that he did are just false accusations. And to give you an understanding, the ones who are who are accusing him, they're religious people about religious things. And they're accusing him of things that are going against the religious the religious writings. But Paul himself used to be one of them who knows those writings, who was who was raised as a young child in these writings, so he knows exactly what they're talking about. And so he's frustrating everybody because he's smarter than most of them. So we're going to pick it up where, where they're going to bring in the King Agrippa and, and, and Bernice and talk about how uh, what's you know about what he's done wrong. And King Agrippa is going to give Paul the opportunity to speak. So we're on uh, Acts chapter 26, beginning with verse 1. Again, like I said, I'll, I'll go through. And then as, we, as, as you have a question, raise up your hands. We'll stop. We'll answer it. We'll, we'll try to get it moving. Okay, verse, verse 1, chapter 26, verse 1. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. So Paul stretched out his hands and answered for himself. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because today shall... I shall answer for myself before you concerning all things which I am accused by the Jews, especially because you are expert in all customs and questions which have to do with the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to hear me patiently. Now Paul's going to get into his, talking about his youth. He says, My manner of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation at Jerusalem. All the Jews know. They knew me from the first, if they were willing to testify, that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. So what they're talking about is, during this time, the 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 Jews, they had the Pharisees, they had the Sadducees. The Pharisees, as we, as, as we talked about, they believed, they believed in the writings uh, 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 that, that there, there's going to be a, a Messiah, the Christ, Jesus Christ, that was going to come and that there was going to be a, a, a proof of a resurrection, which is what Jesus Christ did. The Sadducees, they didn't believe in resurrection. They, they didn't believe that that was going to take place. So remember Paul, what he did is he said that when they're accusing him, he says, well, they're mad at me because I'm talking about the resurrection. The Pharisees had no choice but to stand behind what he was saying because they believed in the resurrection. The Sadducees got all mad and they disappeared because they don't believe in the resurrection. So Paul, what he's saying now is he's in front of King Agrippa. He says, listen, listen, King, I know the Jewish laws. I know what they are because I was raised as a child to be a Pharisee and I've been studied in this stuff. I've learned this stuff. I've read the writings. I know the very things that they're talking about. That's what he's letting them know. He's letting them know, hey, I know all, we know all these things. He even says that that uh, that that my own nation at Jerusalem, all the Jews know. They knew who he was. And he's going to get deeper into that. He says, they knew, verse 5, they knew me from the first if they were willing to testify according to the strictest sect of our religion. The sect means um, like, a, like a group. A, a, a group of people, the strictest sect, meaning there was there was people within the religion that would be like a sect or a section, would be just a small group, and they were like the strictest of the law. They were the ones that were hardest on everything, and that's who Paul was. The strictest of the sect of our religion. Verse 6, and now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. To the promise our twelve tribes earnestly serving God, night and day, hope to attain. For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. Why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison. Having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them, and I punished them often 
in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted you to them, even to foreign cities. So Paul's giving King Agrippa, he's letting him know, this is who I am. And you got you to put it in perspective. So the very thing that they're doing to him, he was doing to the followers of Jesus Christ. So before the conversion of Paul, before when he was still Saul, because remember, when Saul was on the road to Damascus, he 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 got blinded and he got he got he got an encounter with Jesus. God even changed his name to Paul, went from Saul to Paul. And he's telling him, he says, I was one of the guys like them. I knew the laws according to the way they're telling you the laws, and I accused people too. I would say, I would say they said things that were blasphemous. I got letters, and I had the authority to imprison these people. I did the very thing. So he's letting the king know. He says, "Hey, I'm not a stranger to what's going on. I know these people. They don't like me. They're trying to. They're trying to persecute me. They're trying to put me in prison. They're trying to kill me. But I understand why they're doing." I know why they're acting the way they're acting. I know why they're accusing me of the things they're accusing me, because I was one of them too. Which is important to understand because when Paul says this, we know we're talking about like a, a, a big event, you know, in front of a king and, and courtship and everything else. But when he tells me, he says, I understand, I know, I, I did that very thing. That's important to understand. As we live for God, we're going to come across people that are doing things in which we've done. Live lives in which we live. And, and what that means is you need to understand some of these people. You need to understand where they come from. Because, you know, as you live for God, you can get closer to God. And sometimes people get caught up in, in the religion of it and the spirituality of it. Right now we just sang a couple of good slow songs that... Uh, uh, that when you're singing them and you're lifting your hands and you're full surrenderance, you can begin to feel the presence of God falling into this room. Amen. And, and, and it's a powerful feeling. Yes. But we can get so caught up in the feeling that we forget who we were and where we're going and how we've gotten there. Which means, what, I, what that means is there's so many people out there that are doing the things that you did. See, before I gave my life to God, I, did, I, I didn't want to be nothing with God. I didn't even know who God was. I've said this before. I remember asking the, the my first pastor, who's this Jesus guy you keep talking about? I literally asked him that. Who's this Jesus guy? What's this apostles and, and disciple thing that you keep talking about? He looked at me like he wanted to slap me. And, and, and I go, and he thought I, I think he was, thought I was being sarcastic. And I, and I looked at him, I go, no, I'm serious. I don't know who this Jesus thing is. I don't know what you're talking about. Because I didn't know God. I, there was a time I didn't know God, right? And many times you can get people coming to church, you know, that are new, who don't know God the way you know God. Right. So we gotta we gotta understand that you know what people need to, people have to have a time of of, of, of reconciliation with God, to understand who God is. And it, it's important that Paul says this because as he says it, he's he's actually bringing a level of empathy into what they're doing. He's saying, I understand where their hearts at right now. I understand why they're coming after me. I get it. Because I did the same thing. But I did it foolishly. But I did the same thing. Remember, remember when 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 uh, when they were stoning one of the one of the one of the disciples? Who was there? Paul. He was still Saul at the time. What does the Bible say? It says that he was standing there protecting the clothes of those who were stoning him, and he was nodding in agreement with the stoning and the, the killing of, of the disciple. So Paul's down and says, Hey, I, I know what's going on. I, I, I was. I, that's who I was. And what he's doing, he's building up King of Reba as to why he is who he is right now. Okay, anybody have any questions so far? Any, any input? Okay. So we'll pick it up on verse 12. Remember he said that he would even go to foreign cities. Remember he left to go to Damascus. He was going to a foreign city. And that's when this conversion took place. So verse 12. While thus occupied, as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, along the road I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me. Those who journeyed with me, 
And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the Boaz. So I said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand to your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will, uh, that I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you to the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open the eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Now, this is Jesus talking. There's a couple of key things that Jesus is saying here. Okay? He says, He says, I will deliver you from Jew, the Jewish people as well from the Gentiles. Okay. At this particular time, you got to put it in perspective. Paul, well, Saul at the time, he's talking about his conversion when he was on the road to Damascus. He's talking about when he had his encounter with Jesus. Okay, so that's what he's speaking of. This is how I know Jesus is real, was what Paul's telling the king. He says, I know Jesus is real because I have physically and personally seen him with my own eyes. I know he is real. I know he's real because I have experienced the love and the power of Christ. I know he's real. See, those are still words we can say today. I know God is real because I have experienced the power and the love of Christ. Yes. I know I have. Yes. When I gave my life to God, it was it was it, it was a life changing experience for me. Now, he says, but remember, Saul at this time was still a Pharisee, barely being converted. That same minute, that same conversation, but Jesus is telling him, "I will deliver you from the Jews." So to Paul, you got to think about it. Paul is probably thinking, what do you mean deliver me from the Jews? They're with me. I'm one of them. What are you talking about? But he says, and the Gentiles, which made sense because the Gentiles who he was, who he was persecuted because it was the Gentiles that were following Jesus. Because remember, the Bible says that, 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 that he came to his own and they received him not, which means that Jesus came to his own people, which he came for the Jews, and they didn't receive him, so he went to the Gentiles. Yeah. Jesus. So when he says, I'm going to deliver from the Gentiles, that probably made sense to Saul. When he's going to deliver from the Jewish people, but what are you talking about? I don't understand that. Then he says, then he also says, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light. Darkness to light. Darkness to light. I heard a, I heard a, uh, a sermon before. And I like to take credit for it, but it wasn't mine. Someone else's preacher better than me. Um, talking about night, okay? Darkness to light. Darkness to light. Not darkness, but darkness. So, darkness to light. Nothing good happens in darkness. And that's what the sermon was about. Nothing good happens in darkness. Darkness. It says darkness to light. What is that talking about? It was talking about sin, life outside of God. Light, where everything's exposed, you're living for God. Yeah. Two different lives, right? So he says, he tells Paul, Paul's saying, he says, Jesus told me that he's going to use my life to bring people from darkness to light. Which means he's going to be used as, as a vessel of God to bring the word of God to people that you no longer need to live in a life of darkness. You need to live a life of sin, a life of hopelessness. See, before I gave my life to God, I was living a life of hopelessness. My wife and I were getting ready for a divorce. It was a hopeless situation. I didn't know what was going to happen. I, yeah. Drugs, violence, guns, none of that got through me to God. I, was, that was, I wasn't afraid of that. The only thing I was afraid of was losing my family. 
when me and my wife got to the point where we were going to divorce, that I was afraid of because I, was, I didn't want to lose my kids, I didn't want to lose my wife, I didn't want to lose my family. That drew me to God. Yeah. But before that, the darkness I lived in was perfectly fine. It was perfectly fine. You know why living in darkness or living a life of sin is, is, is perfectly fine for most people? It's simple. Because we make sin fun. We, we think sin tastes good. A lot of times it does. We think sin, sin smells good. Why? Because a lot of times it does. We think sin feels good. Why? Because a lot of times it does. But it all comes to an end. And that's what Paul's saying to, to King of Greek. He says, he says, no, Jesus told me that it is my duty to bring people out of darkness and into the light. What was it like? Well, he tells me, he told the Greek it says, when I was on the road, a light shone around me, and those that were with me. Who was the light at that time? It was Jesus, right? Jesus was the light that shone around him, that came around him and glowed around him. The story, when, when you read the story about that event, the light was the light was so glorious, it blinded him. Okay? So they actually had to, to guide Saul at this time to, to, to Damascus, and that's where he went, and, and it's another story. But it was the light. So that was important. That's what, those are important things that Paul's trying to, trying to get across to the king because they're accusing him of coming against God. They're accusing him of saying bad things about God. Now, today, people use God's name in vain all the time. All the time. They're all the time. All the time. People are using God's name in vain for this, for that, for that, for this. In biblical times, if you did that, it, it can mean death. In prison, you don't do that kind of stuff. That's, that's, again, that's, that's against the law. There's certain third world countries where they have false gods, and if you do that over there, they imprison you and kill you also. So that, that was a whole different thing. But that's what's going on. Anybody have any questions? Anybody? I know I give a lot of information. I get like, like long-winded. I give a lot of information. I always say I want people to ask questions and ask and say something, but I wind up talking so much that I think I answer all the questions. <laughs> it's all good, brother. You guys don't have to agree with me that you know. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I understand when you're saying, uh, uh, you know, when people come to God and, uh, you know, you got to be patient with the new you know, believers and stuff because it's going to take time to understand. You know what God is doing in their lives and who God is, just just like He did with us. I mean, we didn't, you know, you know. I mean, yeah, we were saved overnight, instantly when we gave our lives to Jesus. But we still walk out of the door, and, and that old lifestyle still kind of hangs around, you know. Right, right. But you know, that's the basic. You know, we can't be judgmental, you know. We're just, and, you know. People are still going to wear their khakis and uh, <laughs> eat cholos and all that. Is, uh, but, you know, their, their old lifestyle falls off as you, you know, continue yeah, as you move forward. As you move forward. You, know, you don't force it. You let God do it. Yeah, you let God do it. We're, we're the tools of God. We're not the convictor of God. Right. Thanks for Jesus. Amen. Amen. But it's true. I know when I gave my life to God, I didn't know anything about God. I didn't know all I knew was that my life was that. The life I had there mm -hmm. was no good. I wanted something different over there. I just wanted to do it. Had to take took, time. Took time. Yeah. Just took time. Okay, so let's continue on to verse. See right here, it looks like a 19, a 16, or 12. Oh, it's 19. 19. 19. <laughs> 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 verse 19. Therefore, King Agrippa, this is Paul still talking. I was not dis disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent, turn to God, and do the works befitting repentance. For these reasons, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. Therefore, having obtained help from God, to this day I stand, witnessing both to small and great saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come. See, 
that is where he's going to begin to make people mad. See, two things here. One is, let's start with the first one. He says, he says basically, he says that he's witnessing to both the uh, small and, 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 and the big, okay? Let's put that into age. We, wanna, we always want to talk to people about God when it comes to like older people. You know, people who are adults, people who maybe understand more, people who maybe have jobs, or you know, maybe older than you, or you know, somebody your age, and that's and then that's good. We need to. But he says to the little ones also, we can't discount the kids either. Don't 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 ever discount the kids. Never discount the kids. And here's what: even in our fellowship, the churches that we have around the world. Most of our leadership pastors today have been serving God 30 years, 30, 30 plus years, 40 years, and gave their lives to God as preteens and teenagers who are now ministry leaders and been serving God all these years, preaching around the world, doing the things of God. Because somebody understood, don't dismiss the young ones. Because the young ones, need, they're going to grow up on it. They're gonna, they need to know something. They need to know about God. They need to know that there is hope. You know that I think my life would have been a lot easier if I would have known there was hope in something other than myself. I, I had no hope in nothing else. I thought I thought it was gonna be a cool thing one day to die in a, in a shootout. I thought that was gonna be like my life. I thought, you know, one day I'm gonna end a shootout. And in my mind I thought it was gonna be with the cops. I thought one day I'm just gonna have a shootout with the cops and this is what it is. And, you know, so what I even told my mom, she laughed at me. She wasn't even concerned. She just laughed. Yeah. But that's just the life that we had. Yeah. But if somebody, as a, when I was a child, let me know that you know what, that there's hope in Jesus, yeah. then maybe I could have found something different along the way. Yeah. Because yeah. when you live a hopeless life, you do hopeless things. That's good. And, that, and that's what happens. So, so Paul says, you know, he's been, he's been telling this to the young ones and to the old ones and everyone in between because everybody needs hope. Yeah. Any questions? Anybody? That's good. I wish somebody would have told me something about Jesus when I was little. You know what I mean? Or had the opportunity to be raised in church like my kids were. You know? Right. I mean, I mean, the lives of my kids live now because I raised them in church. Uh, my God, they're living such a blessed life today, and uh, I didn't have that. You know, you know what I mean? I said all the time, when I grew up, graduating high school was not even a thought. <laughs> it, it was not a thought. It was not something that we said in our house that you're going to graduate high school. No. And the last year I tried to pass any classes was the eighth grade. It's always time to have an eighth grade education. <laughs> so how is it that my kids are college graduates? There you go. It's God. Because, it's because of God. God's God. God. It's the grace of God. Yes. They never, you never discount the children. Amen. So, verse 23. That the Christ would suffer. Let me go back to 22. Therefore, having obtained help from God, to this day I stand, witnessing both to small and great, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses had said would come. Well, that's what I want to touch on that. Now he's letting them know. He says, you know what? I'm not doing nothing outside the line of the word of God that they're trying to accuse me of. I'm doing it according to what the prophets and Moses said, that what they said. The prophets and Moses wrote it, and this is exactly what's happening. And he says in verse 23, that the Christ would suffer, that he would be the, the, the first to rise from the dead. And would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. So he's bringing he's bringing forefront the very thing from the Word of God according to what the Jews are reading reading at the time, and, and saying this is exact. I'm doing exactly what, what what their teachings are telling us. I'm going. I'm doing. I'm doing everything in accordance to what their teaching. The ones who are trying to kill me and accuse me of doing wrong things. I'm doing everything according to their teachings. That's important. The Word of God is the Word of God. Nothing changes. People always say, well, what kind of church do you guys have? Well, what kind of, you know, what kind of religion? Well, I believe this and I believe that. Well, you can believe anything you want. Just, is, it, is it in the Bible? That's all I care about. It's in the Bible, and I'm going to believe it. Without the Bible, you can keep your story to yourself. 
I only believe what's in the Bible. If it's in the Bible, then it's true. If it's not in the Bible, it's not true. It's fairy tale, right? You believe what the Bible is. And that's what it comes to living for God. It's when it's written in black and white and sometimes red, you believe it. If it's not, then well, I don't know if I should believe that. Okay, verse 24. Now, as he thus made his defense, Festus said, Imagine Festus. I <laughs> want you guys to name your child Festus. <laughs> Festus, what's, what's the other one from the other day? Priscilla? Um, Priscilla? Priscilla or something like that? It was a couple ago. Priscilla and Festus. Okay. Now, as he thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning is driving me, driving you mad. Now he's saying you're too smart. That's what he's saying. For much learning is driving you mad. Yeah. You're so, Paul, you're so smart, you're dumb, is what he's saying. Yeah. Verse 25. But he said, I'm not mad, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason. For the king before whom I also speak freely knows these things. For I am convinced that none of these things escapes his attention, since this thing was not done in a corner. In other words, I did it out in the open. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. So now he's calling out the king. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuaded me to become a Christian. <laughs> you almost got me, Paul. You almost got me. It says that. <laughs> it says in verse 28, he says, Then Agrippa said to Paul, You almost persuaded me to become a Christian. Yeah. You almost got me, Paul. You, you clever guy, you crazy. You almost got me. <laughs> I didn't write it, I'm just reading it. <laughs> and Paul said, I would to go that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. He said, I want people to know God in the way I know God. I want people to understand who Jesus is the way I understand him. Because I want them to be just like me, except for the chains. I don't want them to be in prison. See, Paul, when we, when we, read, when we read Paul's letters, I have it up here. One of, uh, in one of the scriptures Paul writes, and he writes it over and over again, is, is, is he says the most powerful statement any Christian could say. Paul says, imitate me just as I imitate Christ. What he says in, that, in those words means, he says, if you want to make it to heaven, follow me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to make it there. I'm going to do everything God has asked me to do, and that's what I'm going to do. If you want to know how to get to heaven, follow me. I had somebody ask me that one time. You know, they, so going to someone, and I tell them, well, my Bible says, no, what before to get you shall prosper. And he tells me, Pastor, how do you do that? Why do you do that? Because when you say it, you're so confident. Well, because it's true. But how do you get that way? I go, it's easy. Oh, follow me. I go, follow me, and I'll teach you how to do that. Just, just follow me. Do what I do. Go follow me. And watch, you, and watch the Spirit of God grow. And watch, and watch, and watch the power of Christ follow. And go. So that's one of the most powerful things that you can ever say. So keep that in mind. Paul's saying that he wants people to know Christ right here the way he knows him. He wants people to be just like him. He said, accept the change because he didn't want to be in prison. Mm -hmm. But the most powerful thing you can do is tell somebody, follow me. You want to make it to heaven, follow me. The reason why that's so powerful is because in order to say that, you don't need to be honest with that person. In order to say that, you've got to be honest with yourself. Right. That's the hardest thing. Because you can tell somebody anything you want. You can tell you can say anything you want, right? But you can't lie to yourself. Try. People try all the time. People, you, you ever met somebody that lies so much that they believe their own stories? I mean, they, they, they'll, they'll, they'll tell you a good one. I mean, they'll sit there and tell you all kinds of, man. I know my sister-in-law's watching, but man, I remember my brother. 
He used to sell he used to sell five gallon buckets, pink buckets, empty ones, and call them diaper bags, duck bag uh, buckets, man. He 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 tell anything to anybody. You know, that was his old life. He saved him. He was a Christian. He was going to church, you know. He was talking to us. He's probably laughing right now. But because he watches in Pennsylvania, but they watch the sermon. So, but the most powerful thing is, is I, I want you to have what I have. Okay? It's not saying it. It's being truthful with yourself. Okay? So we're, we're, called, we're called to follow Christ, right? We're called to be Christ-like. Be a Christian is to be like Christ, right? We are citizens of Christ. Think of it that way. The book of Ephesus, the, the book of Ephesians was a letter written to the church in Ephesus, right? But they call it Ephesians, right? Why? Because it was written to the Ephesian people, right? I went over this the other day. The, the book of Philippians was written to the church in Philippi. The people of that church in that region were called the Philippians. Those were the people. We are those are the people of that region. Those are the America. We live in America. We're Americans. You live in Mexico. You're Mexican, right? If you're doing Peru. You're Peruvian. Right? You get the the ends, right? We are Christians. Okay. We are we we are of Christ. We are citizens of Christ. Right. We are part of that royalty. We're part of that that house. We're part of the house of Christ. So we need to act. Like the house that we're a part of, make sense? Yes. So when when Paul says, "I want, I want what I have for them, I want it for them," the the salvation, the forgiveness, the the sanctification, the healing, the the the, 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 the everything that God has given me, I want that for them. But I want them to follow me so they can get. I want you. If you come with me, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna achieve this together. I want to do this with you. Yeah. But to do that, you really gotta be honest with yourself. Do you want another you walking around? It was a long time I didn't want another me walking around. I probably bet my wife doesn't want another me walking around. <laughs> but do you, would you want another me walking around? Could you say, I want to make you like me and know that that's gonna, that person's going to make it to heaven? Because they're like you. That's good. Right? That's the goal. I want people to make it to heaven. So I'm going to do all I can to live the best life I can for Christ so I can get them to heaven. Because that's the goal. And in doing that, I'm hoping to teach someone to have that same attitude to get them to heaven. To get them to heaven. To get them to heaven. Yeah. Any questions? Okay. Okay. I go, my guy in Fresno, 
They're going to make him a supervisor. He's going to become one. I go, why? Because I've been working with them to get them to that level. I go, there's another guy that's working with me right now. I'm training him to do my job. Managers not teaching people that because either they're not confident in their own abilities that they can't teach it, or, or they're afraid they're going to lose their job to someone else. It's going to become better than them. I go, that's not the way I think. I go, I get that mentality because I'm a pastor, I'm a Christian who disciples people, who's always trying to help people find their destiny. I go, and unless people begin to understand how to get people to their destiny and help them achieve their destiny, we'll never, we'll never be successful. Never. I go, and that's what we have to do. So he was blown away by my, by my answer, but that's what we do here. The goal is to get somebody into their destiny. What's your destiny? What has God called you? See, every single one of us have a call in God. See, God, God, it's by no coincidence that you're here or if you're watching online that you hear my voice. There's no coincidence in that. There's no coincidence in that. It's a divine, it's a divine appointment. And what, what that is, is, is God has a plan. And I say this over and over again. That God has a plan for your life. He's going to use the circumstances, the things that you've gone through, those horrific things that hurt and, 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 and made you cry and brought so much pain. And, and, and I've been a part of that kind of stuff. Those very things, those things that the, 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 the life of disappointment and not knowing why my life the way it is, how can this happen to happen to me? And, and, and we don't understand, God, why is this happening to me? It's those things that God's going to use to draw someone else to Christ. It's the very thing that you're going through that no matter how horrible it was, someone else may not be able to make it through that. God's going to use you to touch that heart and that life and so they'll know that there's hope. That's why it's important that like what Paul's saying. He's saying, he's saying, I want them to have what I have. Because I've been through everything that these guys are accusing me. I've been through all that. And it got me nowhere. He's realistically what he's saying. The very things that these people are accusing me of, the things that the writing, the things that they're teaching, the things that they're not following themselves, the things that I was doing, and I was going to go to the same hell that they're going to go to if they don't repent. And that's what Paul is said to be saying. I just want them to come follow me so they can have the same reward on them. That's all he's saying. That's why, that's why the great day is because God needs you to know that that's who you are to begin. That he's going to use your life in a way that you never thought. Who would have thought? Me. I don't really speak Spanish at all. I could, I could, I could order me a good burrito, some manudo. I, I, I got that now. I don't really speak Spanish. But I'm now preaching for all Mexico. Who would have thought? Yeah, I got an interpreter, but I still have to talk to everybody. And my Spanish is getting better. But did you know that I, my wife and I will be married 29 years next month, together 31 years. And when I met her in 1990, I didn't speak any Spanish at all. At all. And now I'm ministering over there. So the very thing that you think that you cannot accomplish. Just don't worry about that. When Moses was, 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 was commissioned by God to go to, to the Pharaoh to get the, the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt and, and set them free, Moses said, oh, oh, how am I going to do the living? I don't talk right. right? He stuttered. I don't, I don't know how to speak right. But he said, Aaron, come here. 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 Aaron, you go do what I'm trying you to do. You tell Aaron what needs to be said. He'll talk to the Pharaoh for you. But go get it done. It's a, it's a plan. But I can't. I don't know how. I, it's, it's not me. It's not in my. It's not in my DNA. It's not what I do. You don't understand. I was abused as a child, so I'm really timid. <laughs> Nobody believes me, including my wife. I was shy at one time. <laughs> Nobody believes that. <laughs> but I was. I, I swear I was. I was about four years old. <laughs> All right, let's continue. Verse 49. <laughs> and Paul said, I would, 
I would, oh no, I already done, verse 30. When he had said these things, the king stood up, and as, as well as the governor and Bernice, and those who sat with them, and when they had gone aside, they talked among themselves, saying, This man is doing nothing deserving of death or chains. Then Agrippa said to Festus, This man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. The reason why he says that because since he said that he wanted to be tried before Caesar, they had to send him to Caesar. They had to. Paul did that because he was going to go into the imperial city, and that's a place that he's been trying to get to for, throughout his ministry. And that's where he was. That's where they're headed to. And that's where Paul knew how to get there. He was through saying, "I want to. See, I want to. Be, I want to be seen before Caesar." So Paul knew exactly what he was doing. So now they're going to send him to Caesar. But Festus says, "You know what? If you want to ask for Caesar, we'll just let him go now." So, there's going to be things in who you are and what, you, what you've done in life that God wants to use and change for you. Things that you never thought. You know those pains, those secrets, those hurts that, that, that you haven't even shared with people because you're either embarrassed or you don't even know how to say it because you don't want to repeat it. It's too hard for you. Those are the things that God wants to kill you from. Those are the things that God's going to take from you and then show you how to use that to help that next person. So there's a plan for your life. You find calling from God. To say that that's not true for you is to say that Jesus Christ died in vain. That's, that's the reality. Well, not me. You know, maybe them, or maybe them, but not me. No. To say that is to say... You know what, God? You sent your son, but you know what? No, thank you. You're going to give it to them. No, 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 I mean, that's what we're doing. No. Jesus Christ died for all. To change our lives. To get us where we need to be. Okay? Any questions? Any more? I mean, I like every about our red clothes, just for a moment. Every about our red clothes. No one looking around. I want to do something real quick. You know, tonight, you're here, and and you're not saved. You might not even know what that term means. You may not know what being saved is. And you know what? That's okay. You don't need to. All you need to know is that right now, there's something tugging in your heart. Something that's telling you that, you know what? There's something different going on here. There's something different that I'm not used to. Something I don't know what this is. I remember the day I gave my life to God. I have no clue what the preacher talked about. No idea at all. You could have been telling me how to put together a bookshop. I wouldn't have known. All I knew is that when it came time for the altar call, I knew something was pulling in my heart. And he asked if I wanted to accept Jesus Christ. And that day when, when I gave my life to God, my wife gave her life to God, right alongside me, and our lives have never been the same. So tonight you're here. You're not saved. And you feel that tugging in your heart. And you, want to, you, want to, you want to say, you know what, I'm not sure what this is, but I want to give it a shot. If that's you, you're in this place. Say, amen. You want to just raise your hand. Amen. I want to pray with you. I'll do this place in there. Don't be embarrassed. I'm not trying to get you to join a church. I'm not going to get you to sign a membership card or, or, or seal it in blood. All I want to ask you is just let me pray with you. That's it. Just a simple prayer of salvation. So if you're in this place, amen, you want to accept Jesus Christ, you just raise your hand. You know what? Uh, we're going to stand. Let's all stand. We're going to, uh, we're going to dismiss. But we're going to let's all stand. Um, I want to thank you for coming tonight. Because you know what? God, God, God has a plan. He has a plan that is bigger, bigger than your thoughts. He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. For my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And, and his thoughts of who you are is bigger than what you think of yourself. So you know what? God has a plan for you. I want to encourage you. Uh, we have a, a woman's class on Saturday at 11 o'clock. You're welcome to join us, say man. Well, not me, because I'm not a woman, but there are some women. <laughs> we're going to have food and, and everything. Um, we're going to have a sister up here playing music for the for the praise and worship. She's going to bring her keyboard and guitar. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we're going um, to have food after. And everything's going to be a good time. We'll find other people, other women that are saved. If not, Sunday morning, we encourage you to come back. We're going to have uh, Pastor Andy Fernandez will be here. So we're going to have a good time. 
you want to encourage you to do that. Amen. And uh, so, you know what? I hope this happened tonight. Get this tonight, you guys, and, uh, and uh, read the next chapter before next Wednesday. Understand it, read it, and ask questions. I'm here to ask, answer questions. And, and I do, I'll be the first to tell you, I do not know everything. I don't. Matter of fact, if you ask my wife, she'll say, I don't know anything. Amen. And she's probably right. Amen. I don't know anything. But we're going to figure it out together. Amen. Amen. And you know what? We're going to go through it together. There's no dumb questions. Everything's open. And we're here, amen, to just go through and serve God together. Amen. So amen. we're going to be dismissed, amen. So let's bow our hearts, amen, as we, as we close the Oh, my Father, we thank you, God, tonight, God, for your word. We thank you for your message. God, I pray, God, in the name of Jesus, God, that you just help us, God, and still these words into our hearts, God. God, I pray, God, that you just use our lives, God. God, that we'll no longer hold back, God, and that we'll just surrender unto you, God. We thank you, God, for all that you're doing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.